when the full professor has allowed me to start. <laughs> It is my great puedes, puedes empezar. Puedo empezar. <risa> Mira, de mi grupo alguno hay. Pues a ver si aprendéis, ¿eh? veis que la, la jerarquía se mantiene, aunque pase 15 años. <risa> well, anyways, let's switch to English because this talk is being recorded and streamed over YouTube. So it is our great pleasure to host at the Donosti International Physics Center, Diego Romero Bujetas. Uh, I could say many things about Diego, but I'll keep it short. You did your PhD in CSIC, Instituto de Optica, could be? Estructura de la materia. Estructura de la materia. It's always complicated for a non CSIC person to talk CSIC. <laughs> <laughs> With uh, Sanchez uh, Hill. And now Diego is in the University of Freiburg, working with Luis Froufe, another good friend of the Donosti International Physics Center. And with this, I leave the stage to you to teach us about forces in disorder systems. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, uh, first, I would like to say that I'm really happy and an honor for me to be here because I was here at the time doing different internship. And it's the first time that I, did, I want to do a, a seminar, so I'm very happy for that. So I, we are going to talk about optical random forces in the bipolar system, and I correct a typo in the talk. In the in the actual word, iteration should be interaction, mm -hmm. control colloidal interaction. I want to present a word done in collaboration with Augustan Master, is the PhD student and Luis Frufe Perez. I come from Fribourg, and the first thing I need to say. Uh, you need to touch again, try a couple of times, and it usually uh, uh, from the computer. Ah, uh, okay. Okay, that's it. Okay. All right. I see. Yes. I come from Fribourg in Switzerland. I would like to show you this slide because sometimes there is some confusion about the Fribourg in Switzerland or Fribourg or Freiburg in, in, in Germany. <laughs> I come from Switzerland, this beautiful country with a beautiful landscape. It's a city between Berna, Berna and Lausanne, and it's a very Swiss place. It's a, it's a, I saw you a picture of the, of the city from outside, from one of the entries of the city. You see the, the cathedral, the, the, well, the new town, the, the old town, and of course, we are in Switzerland, we have cows everywhere around. <laughs> Beautiful places. Going back to the work. Uh, I work in the physics department. I, I, ha I haven't any picture of the front view. This is the only picture I have in a cold day, in a winter cold day. And this is the group picture of the previous year. So some of the people have left, but new people is, is in the group. And specifically, I work in more uh, closely with Augustan Master, is the PhD student, and Luis Frofe Perez is the principal <laughs> research. So I will I would like to show you what is the, the outline of the talk first. We're going to talk about a little bit the um, a motivation introduction about optical forces. In colloidal system, it is a little bit fake because I'm not an expert in colloidal system. And in the end, for me, a colloidal system is a is a, a system of dipole, dipolar particles. <laughs> uh, later, I'm going to show the theory about what is a random field. Uh, what is the way to calculate the optical forces and use uh, what is the couple dipole approximation we can use to describe this system? And later, uh, we're going to finish to do some examples about how to use these tools to, uh, to generate, to, to engineering the forces between particles. So let's go to the first part. Uh, I would like to highlight the electromagnetic force do induce optical forces because normally we don't take care about that. But uh, I, I am the first of the first that do that. I take my sample. My sample is a, a wave of particles, and then I would like to calculate transmission, reflection. Then I the, I have a, a sharp uh, I have a, a sharp window for transmission. A given frequency is this system is very nice. So if I shine light in this system, a free standing system, of course, in the end I will have optical forces, and the system is going to move. I want to have diffusions and the system want to move to the equilibrium configuration. So we need to get these optical forces. It's true that in these specific cases, in the end, uh, we don't have a never, we don't have never a free standing system. We have a substrate supporting our system, and instead of to have a sphere, we have something like a disk. We have an array of disks, more physical, more easy to, to do experimentally. And then in this case, if we sign the system, uh, we have something like that, but when you uh, if I know they have a strong resonance, it's a given frequency, 
I sign the system, there is optical forces, but in the system is attached, there is a stress, but if the optical field is not very high, there is no deformation and everything is okay. But uh, since I would like to talk about optical forces, I'm more interested in this kind of system, no? free standing system or a bunch of particles floating away in a, in a liquid on another medium. And this is more or less what is the definition of a colloid. Because in general, a colloid is a, uh, it's a suspension of a, a phase in different phases. Uh, for example, one of the more famous colloids, or at least the, the colloid that people really like, is the milk. It's a suspension, it can be described like a fat, fatty particles in, a, in water. And the people like because the milk is very white and it's not, it's not easy to get very white colors. And in technology, uh, industrial application, uh, it's interesting. Right now, the people want to remove the titanium dioxide in order to get another material. This, I don't know, talk about, about this topic, but this is one of the reasons why the people like colloid or milk due to the, uh, uh, the property of this system. And if you see the milk in an optical microscope, uh, only a 40 times the amplification, you really can see no? the, the small particles that are floating away. And if you go even closer, you will be something, you will see something like that. You have the, part, the fat particle, and there is a repulsive uh, force between them that allow that uh, you have the colic, no? because if you don't have the repulsive interaction, the colic cannot be formed, and then everything will precipitate. And there is an experiment, I don't know if you know about that. But in the moment that in the milk you have vinegar, you produce a transition, a phase transition, and you create a ricotta cheese. And then if you take the image of the same sample with vinegar, and uh, now a five times amplification, you cannot see anything else. There is a turbulent media, and you cannot, you lose this, uh, some of the properties. And if you do again a closer view, the things that happen is the, the fat particle close go together. This repulsive interaction disappears, and then uh, the system uh, produces a phase transition. And this is done using like a chem, uh, using a, a chemical, well, I don't know if chemical reaction, but the idea is if it is possible to induce this kind of interaction uh, using optical fields and uh, go further in this analogy, uh, colloid has in, are a good, a good system to study the interaction because you can control very well his property, like, and can, you can mimic another system. So we can generalize this phase transition to another kind of phase transition induced by optical fields. With optical fields, it's possible to do a phase transition from a solid state to a liquid state or to a phase to gas state or go back and, uh, back and forth. Uh, you can do other things like a change the correlation function between your particles, the dispersion of particles. You have a random system, you have a UP uniform. I'm going to describe later uh, what is a UP uniform material. Or even though create other, other kind of correlation function between your with your particles. And um, also regarding crystalline phase, uh, depending on the property of your optical field, maybe you if you have, for example, an array of particles and you add a new particle, you can control if the new particle going to be on top on, on the on the particle, on the new particle going to be in the middle of two particles, or be in the in the middle of four particles. That this can be seen like a cubic lattice, like a, I think it's a base center cubic lattice or a FCC lattice. You can control, it's possible to control this kind of phase transition in a general way using optical forces. This is the, the, the question. And the, in, the, in order to try to do that in the future, first we need to understand uh, how to control the optical forces between particles. So for doing that, I'm going to explain a little bit of theory. Hopefully, it's no, you can follow me. It's not very fundamental. And first, I would like to describe what is a random field, because uh, any field can be described as a sound of plane wave. This, this represents a plane wave propagated in a given direction, given by the vector u. And then the plane wave is the amplitude multiplied by a phase. That depends on the direction propagation, and the amplitude can be decomposed into different uh, polarization, s polarized or p polarized. And a random field can be seen as a isotropic and homogeneous field that propagates in all directions. Then, in order to get a, a random field, it's like an integral over all different angles propagation of the different plane waves. And also, in order to have also isotropy and homogeneity about polarization, we need to fulfill some relationship regarding the, the amplitude of the S and P wave. Uh, 
in this case, the, the relation is that the correlation of the S waves between S wave and the S wave and the P wave and P wave should be equal to the same magnitude for all incidents of the region. And, well, and the delta D radius means that the correlation, the, the field are only correlated if they share the same uh, direction of propagation. And the correlation between the S wave, the S part of the wave and the P part of the wave should be totally the correlate, should be totally zero. In the moment that you have this, you fulfill this property, you have a random field. And now if you place a particle in this field, in principle, the average of the force is equal to zero. There is, uh, this doesn't mean that the particle doesn't move. We, we know that there can be, even though if the average is zero, there can be diffusion of this particle. But the important thing is that when we place more particles, now the forces can be different to zero. But we can uh, manipulate what is the force between these particles using these random fields. Maybe this is very abstract. And the, to know what is a random field, maybe the, the best example of a random field are the vacuum fluctuation and the thermal fluctuation of the electromagnetic field. And the energy spectral density is given by the well-known uh, black body radiation. This is the expression. The um, random, the, the vacuum field or the thermal fluctuation field to the energy spectral density is, there is a, a component. This is the vacuum fluctuation and this is the component related to the, to the temperature of the medium. And in this specific case, when if the constant I defined before, so this is the amplitude of your random field is proportional to the energy spectral density of the black body radiation, we get the Casimir Potter forces, or also, also the Van der Waals forces, that is the, the short uh, interaction limit. And then the idea to try to control the interaction with the particle is if we can engineer in the, the amplitude of the field, or if we can modify our energy spectral density to get the forces in which we are interested. So for doing that, we need to know what is the force between different particles. So this is very fundamental. The force is given by the Lorentz force. You have a charge in a given electromagnetic field. The force are going to be proportional to the magnitude of the charge and the speed of, the, of your particle. This expression can be generalized in the case, uh, we have a distribution of charges on current, and this really is the integral of the, of the charge distribution of the electromagnetic field and the, the current distribution and the curve of the magnetic field. And from this expression, you can get the, the forces. In the general way, I'm going to skip the first part. This is the general way. Okay. So this is the end of the talk. <laughs> <laughs> Mostrar de todos modos. Okay. Uh, maybe it's important because only, it's only to say, I want to say the next one because no, maybe we need to cut. Second, I'm going to download the presentation. Your computer, or no, it's the computer. You closed the PowerPoint. Okay, hopefully, it's work now. Okay, yes. but well, in the general way. Uh, we are talking about optical forces and how to calculate the optical forces between uh, particles. In the general way, the force can be the integral of these fields. 
and I will just skip this part because uh, we don't uh, we are don't we don't use it later. Only to say that the, instead to integrate the field in the particle, it's possible to write the force as an integral over the surface that surround a, a particle. So if we go to the optical forces in the dipole approximation, uh, the way to calculate the forces is again use the Lorentz force, and then our system are going to be two charges of different sign separated by the distance s. And the wavelength of operations would be uh, much uh, bigger than the separation of the charge. And then this object are going to have a dipole moment equal to the charge multiplied by the distance of, of the particles. And assuming that there is some kind of potential that link the particle together, it's possible to find the pressure of the forces after the time average of the forces and some approximation, then telling that the particle doesn't move too fast. And another approximation, the force can be equal to the dot product of the dipole moment multiplied by the derivative of the field at the position of the dipole. This is the general expression for a time dependent field. But in the case we have a monochromatic field, the, the expression modified to the real part of the conjugate of dipole moment multiplied by the derivative of the dipole moment. Uh, we are going to talk about uh, using dipole approximation. Then our particle, our, the dipole moment of our particle, are going to be a linear relationship with the uh, coming field uh, given by the polarizability. And then the force finally going to be something like a uh, field multiplied by the derivative of the field. Um, this is the force in, in one particle, in one dipolar particle, but we need to know what is the incoming field in one particle because our system is going to be something like that. The system is going to be described using a couple of dipole approximation with the, all the system is a bunch of particles, a suspension of a small particle, very well described a couple of dipole approximation. So we have our particle around, we have a external field, and the field is scattered by one of the particles, for example, the particle I, the field is scattered at a given position in space, is related to the green function that propagates the field from position or the position of the particle another position. Multiply by the portability of the particle and the exciting field of the particle. But what is the exciting field of the particle? This is the you need to solve for this value. So the exciting field is, that is written as the exciting field at a given particle A, I is equal to the external field at this position plus the scattering field of all the rest of the particles. From all the from position J to all so this is the green function that propagates the field from position J to position I using all this sum and proportional to the exciting field. This system is a linear system of equation that you can solve in order to get the exciting field. I'm going to spend a little bit of time to describe a little bit of the notation I'm going to use, hopefully not very confusing, that this sum, instead to writing in, in a, like a sum, I, I can write everything like a product of matrices. It's written something like that. Now it's like a degree function the propagate the field for the position of all particles, this means the LP bar means the position of all particles in your system, that propagate the field to the particle I, multiplied by the vector field, they're going to have the information of all the field in all particles. If you, maybe it's a, very, a little bit abstract, but using a, a, a matrix representation of these tensors in which the electromagnetic field, the exciting field are going to be the field of first particle, the field of second particle, using this basis, like at this field, this object is going to be the field and in one particle one, particle two, or particle three. Then you can write this green function that go from all the particles to the particle line can be like a, a row of green function that goes from, from particle one to particle I, from particle two to particle I, so, so forth. And also since we need to remove the interaction of the particle with itself, because this interaction is already considered in the polarizability, we need to remove it. Uh, we are also assume that the green function that go from the same position to the same position is equal to zero. This is, this is not true, but using the, this approximation is the way to say, is the way to avoid the i equal j uh, element. So using this notation, we can do it again the same. No, uh, This object was a three-dimensional vector. Now it's a 3n dimensional vector where n is the number of particles. We can do the same with this vector here. This is a three-dimensional vector. We can uh, go to a n-dimensional vector particle and read and write something like that. Where now this green function is like a, the is the how the field propagate for all the particles, the position of the particle to the position of all the particles. And the matrix representation maybe is a little bit clear if I tell, tell you that the matrix representation of this 
this big tensor is the green function that goes to one to one, that should be a zero, or the, the propagation to two to one, the three to one, the two to one, so so forth. So now it's easy to solve for a sighting field. We are able to uh, compute what is the field in every single particle. And then it's the uh, solve the equation. If we rename this matrix as a, I call it A, uh, and we can simply write something like a exciting field proportional to the inverse of this matrix. This is the, for me, the DDA matrix. This is the matrix that tells you how all particles interact with each other. And then the exciting field is the inverse of the D matrix multiplied by the external field. So we know the external field, but for the optical forces, we need also the derivative of the field. Uh, I want to grow, grow, write the expression. Here is a vectoral component. This is the, the three component of the, of the force. Uh, we focus in one component of the force. Uh, we can simply write like a, the one component of the force are going to be the field multiplied by the derivative of the field along this duration. The total force in all on all the system, the sum of all the forces are going to be the top product of these big, mm -hmm. big vectors. Uh, but if we want only the force in one specific particle, we can take always all the time the, the top product of the specific field and the derivative of the field in a given part. So we know the sighting field, and we need to know what is the derivative of the field. It is something in well, I, Interesting that the, the derivative of the scatter field now is only the derivative of the green function multiplied by the probability and the exciting field. It's important to know that from this step to this step, we in, you don't need to de derivate this object because it makes no sense. Your particle is like a fixing position. You cannot derivate the position of the particle in this case. If you want more details, I can, can discuss later this step. But now we can do the same as before, and then the derivative of the field is the derivative of the coming field, the derivative of the green function that connect of the particle, and the exciting field. And we know the exciting field is the inverted DA matrix. So it's this expression, we have everything, we know the exciting field, the derivative of the field, and now we are, we are able to calculate the forces between the, the particle. And this will be the expression of the forces between the, our system of particles. Depend of the portability of your particle, the inverse DDA matrix, the incoming field, the derivative of the field, and the derivative of the green function. So it's, a, it's good, but uh, we have a small detail that uh, we want to use this expression also for random fields. And uh, we have a problem with a random field. A random field, you don't know what is the value of the field at a given position. You don't know the value of the derivative at a given position. You cannot use this expression in a random field. This expression, you can use it in a deterministic field. You can use it for a plane wave, a Gaussian beam, but not with a random field. You need to play a little bit around with the expression and then try to write to express the force as a function of the correlation between the fields. That is the thing that we, we can know. So using some manipulation and using the property of the trace, uh, and also assuming so, uh, we, so we arrive to this expression with the force is totally the proportional to the correlation of the field and the derivative of the field and the correlation of the field field. And then now this expression is general for any kind of field. If you know the correlation, you can calculate the forces. Doesn't matter if the field is a plane wave, a Gaussian beam, or a random field. Now you can calculate all the time his correlation and calculate the forces. Um, also tells you that in this approximation, of course, we say that the, the inverted DA matrix and the green function depend on the position of your particle. We assume that the particle doesn't move too fast. So we can take uh, these matrices outside of the time average and only do the average of the electromagnetic field. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we have the total force, this is the total trace. This is going to be a, a, a big matrix, but the, the trace of this matrix tells you the forces. And also, uh, if we want the force only one in one particle, I, we know that the force in a specific particle are going to be the partial trace of this big matrix. So this matrix has information of the force in every single particle. And as I said before, this is general for any illumination field. And just for finishing with the theory part, I told you, tell you that uh, we are going to be further with this expression of the force as a function of the correlation of the field. But if the field is totally random in the dynamic equilibrium, the forces are conservative. So we can obtain a potential associated with these forces. And using the properties of the correlation between the field and the derivative of the field and the, and the correlation of the field, 
Now we know that the correlation is proportional to the spectral density, the energy spectral density, and the imaginary part of the green function. And using this information, uh, we can work out a little bit of expression and finally arrive to this beautiful expression with the potential, uh, the potential between the particles is is proportional to the energy spectral density and the trace of the log of the DDA matrix. It's interesting that now we, we don't have any, in, we don't need to invert the DDA matrix. But we need to do the log of the matrix. That this is this is uh, the inversion of the matrix uh, is the operation that mix and entangling of the particle. In this case, in, in the potential, the operation that entangling the particle are going to be the, the log of the matrix. Uh, if this is the potential and a specific frequency, if we want to know the full potential, we need to integrate uh, along all the frequencies. And then the total potential is the integral of the power spectral spectral density multiplied by the log. Of the of the DD match for complete sake of completeness, I'll show you here the DD match. Yeah. And then from now on, the idea is to how depending on the your system, I'm going to you I'm going to define what is the the DD matrix. I'm going to define the property of your system, and we're playing. You know, in the system, we we can play with the uh, power spectral density in order to get the potential that we wish. So you you as a, is the potential for the force. Yeah, if you derive this potential regarding a, a position of a particle, gives you the force of this particle along this position. And how how does it disappear the 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 Green's function explicitly? It's because the imaginary part of the Green function, uh, the correlation is proportional to the imaginary part of the Green function, and here you can operate. Um, because you can see, if you derive this object, this is equal to the derivative of g. Multiply by one over this object, something like that. And then this is equal, the force is the derivative of G multiplied by the inverse DDA matrix. It's something, something like that idea. Mm -hmm. When you are, you, you place this expression here and you work a little bit. So we finally get the expression for the potential. We are going to use it to try to do some uh, interesting examples. Um, the first thing is to present you the particle we're going to use. All the time, uh, we're going to use the, our canonical particle, going to be a spherical particle of diffractive in the N, uh, N equal 3.5, the typical refractive in the for uh, semiconductor in the uh, optical domain, infrared domain. And we are going to use this particle because I present you here the scattering cross section of the particle. And we can see that above this frequency, the system are going to be described by, very well by the, by the dipolar approximation because the uh, green line represents the, the magnetic, it's like a, the magnetic dipole contribution of the response of the particle, and the red line is the electric dipole contribution del, of the response of the particle. Um, uh, we, we are going to use this expression, this particle, because we have a strong resonances. I, I want to show you why this is, uh, is important or it's interesting in this case, because thanks to this resonance, we can uh, create different potentials. Because we can see in this work from 2015 that using this expression, uh, they calculate the potential at two different frequencies. Uh, lambda when it's equal to 200, 2000 nanometer or 1600 nanometer. Uh, they calculate the potential at these two frequencies. The red line is the uh, low, low frequencies and the blue line, high frequency. And you can see, well, in this case, it's true that the particle is the silicon particle, but, but places in water. So the resonance shift a little bit, but the idea is still the same. You have strong resonances and you can describe by electric and magnetic dipole. Also told you, it's true that I derived, derived the expression only assuming that you have electric dipole, but it can be easily generalized when you include also the magnetic, uh, magnetic dipole. And then the, this, uh, this author shows in this paper that changing the frequency, uh, they can go from a very attractive uh, intervention to a very repulsive intervention. And the thing is, uh, and this repulsive intervention comes from to the interference between the electric and magnetic dipole, because this frequency is a little bit above these resonances, and then the dipole the resonance is out of phase, and these uh, interferences lead to this uh, uh, repulsive intervention. Uh, then in this system, uh, only by changing the frequency, uh, we can go to attractive to repulsion. And then the idea is to do a linear combination of energy spectral density and get uh, different uh, potentials profiles. 
No, at the time, I, I told you, I'm going to use this particle all the time. In principle, we are going to focus what is the potential only between two particles. And if we change the particle, we, we need to redo all. The, no, so we need to, depending on the part, the power spectral density will depend on the property of the particle that you are using. But that, that potential that you're uh, giving there is not for random fields, or is it? Ah, it's for random, um, yes. So at the time, uh, we are focused in particles placing random fields. Because we want random fields because they are homogeneous and then all the particles will feel the same. So is that the average? Or... Uh, the derivative of this potential gives you the average of the forces. This is the question. Hmm. But the derivative, I mean, that's not a function of x. That's what I Well, yes, because the, this A is the inverse DDA matrix. Is written here that the, the A is a green function that depends on the position of all particles. So you derivate this, uh, the green function regarding the position of one of the particles, is the, the thing I mean with the derivative. Mm -hmm. So this is the thing is that this is a vector element, a vectorial component, a multi vectorial component, because you can take the uh, forces along different directions to all particles. And this is a number. But this number, you do the derivation regarding a given uh, uh, given coordinate, you get the force or the uh, the force on the, this particle when you move it along this given direction. So to now, all the time we are talking about the random fields, and it's possible to create this kind of field. Uh, in principle, it's possible. You use you can use a laser line and, and with the diffusers, uh, you can try to generate this this field. So the idea is uh, we can we need to find the energy density distribution to get the specific potential. So we are going to solve like this equation. This is a sum of uh, we are going to find what is the energy spectral distribution that gives you a given u. We have a small constraint is the because if uh, we have the constraint that the energy should be positive. And then this uh, makes the things more difficult because if the energy could be negative, uh, yeah. this uh, fit is very easy to do. But since you need to say that this energy is always positive, may this uh, complicated stuff. And this means that maybe it's not possible to fit to any potential in the world. You have some constraints. And then in order to try to get the best fit, we need to do, in our case, we use a non negative least squared algorithm. I'm going to show you the the sample of fitting to different potentials. Yeah, for example, exactly. if we have, you know, we have we have two particles when they cross go very very close together in the hard sphere sphere model, they experience like a exponential force. Then, if we want to control balance this force, we we can try to generate a, a, a potential that is proportional to the inverse of the of a exponential. And then, uh, using this linear fit, uh, we can. We want to, to target this blue line that is a exponential uh, potential. And you see this power spectral density, uh, we are able to do this fit. So in, in this case, it's good, no? Uh, it's possible to get this potential. I'm interested to try to switch this particle. You want, you want to go farther to, to know what happened when the particle go farther together. And this fit is very well. But for example, I will I would like to fit another potential. This is the inverse, like a gravitation, gravitational force, but a repulsive gravitational force, we try to fit this potential and you can see that for this particle and for this energy uh, density, that this, uh, uh, in this basis, because we need to fix the, the frequency for doing the fit, uh, the fit is not very well. You get something, yeah, you get very, something like a one over R, but with a lot of oscillation. So it's not possible all the times to so get a good fitting. In this case, okay. In this case, it's not, it's not good. And then we would like to do something more fundamental to say, okay, I have this particle, I have this range of potential, I have this range of distance, and then which potential we can fit and we can do. And this is the something we can do in the future is we can give a, a recipe of what we can do and what we can not. So what, what do you think the inset? I, can, I don't understand what this ah, means. The inset means what is the, the value of the power spectral density we use to get the potential. For example, if, if we do a linear combination of this line of energies, mm. we will get the, the this potential. So you just choose a, a few 
uh, frequencies or something. Like yeah, that. the idea is to try to fit with less lines possible because uh, in the end, experimentally, you if you need a lot of power, you need to divide the power in different laser lines. And, and they and they, and they are chosen so that you get the potential, or they are chosen because they are from from a black body or something? no? They are chosen in order to get a potential. That we chose, we do a non-negative least square algorithm because the energy should be positive. This is one of the constraints. That... So the algorithm is the one that gives you what are, what are the lines that 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 yes. fits the. Mm -hmm. This is a like a, I mean, it's, it's a linear fitting. Uh, you, you, you can play with uh, some variable. For example, you can also in the fitting you can try to minimize the number of lines, and then you need to add a new term trying to minimize the, the system. But this is a fitting, no? I, I want to fit this potential, and then using some constraint, I you tell me, ah, with, if I use this energy distribution, I get this potential. So it's very good. But if I use this distribution, this is the best potential I, I get, and then it's not very good. And then we need to look further which potential is possible to do it, and what of them are not possible to do. So and this potential maybe can be useful to generate stealthy uniform point patterns in real space because I'm going to explain you a little bit what that means a uniformity. You uh, here I present you your, your two pattern system. The first one is a total disorder system. I think it's the hard sphere model. And this case is a disorder but UP uniform. By eyes, it's very difficult to differentiate what is each other. In this case, it's true that the number of particles in the box is smaller than this one, and then it looks like that this is different. But I told you, I saw the images that it's not possible to differentiate by the eyes. You need to see what is the, stru the structure factor of the system. Where the structure factor is the, is the Fourier transfer of the, of the space, of the position in space. So if you go to the structure factor of the total disorder uh, system, you get something like very similar to a percus jelly. Is that you present a this oscillation, that this short range correlation peaks. But when you have a upper uniform medium, uh, it's interesting that the structure factor goes to zero below a given value. And this means, this is very interesting, the below a critical k, the structure factor is equal to zero. And since the mean free path is proportional to the integral, um, uh, to the integral of the structure factor, this means that if you, with the wavelength, the, uh, the frequency is smaller than half of the frequency of the cutoff frequency, the mean free path goes to infinity, and then this system is transparent. So even though the system is disordered, we have transparency. And for this reason, this kind of this medium are interesting, or the people are interested to generate this medium. And it's, it's known that the, for generating this medium, uh, this configuration are the equilibrium configuration when the uh, the per interaction potential is equal to this function. It's a vessel function divided by his argument. The thing is, the people generate this structure, but instead to use the potential real space, this is a bit of details, but in, they use, uh, they work in the reciprocal space and they generate the simulation. But if we want to do an experiment to generate this in a real experiment, we need to try to use the real space uh, potential. And then uh, we can try to fit to the potential to, to our system. It's again the silicon particle system in water. And this is the, the fitting that we did uh, to get to this, this function. And we see that the, the fitting have only four spectral lines, so it look very well. And the pattern is very, very similar. So maybe it's possible if we apply a random field with this property and do a molecular, molecular dynamic, dynamic, we can get this UP uniform pattern. But before to try this Tiger potential, we're going to we do some simulation assuming that the real potential is this one. Only to know if the normal potential is the good, uh, like a the testing, no? the testing uh, example. And there is some problems, or to summarize the problem that uh, we try to generate this structure using this real potential, not the fitting, the real potential that gives you to the steady uniform uh, pattern using a molecular dynamic and a spherical box with reflection boundary condition. And this, we need to do that because the, the density should be constant, because the density depends on the critical case. There is some details that is not very interesting than, than now. The thing is, uh, we try to do, to do the molecular dynamic with 2,000 particles, more or less. Um, the results, uh, I show you here the structure factor of the system. This is the log scale of the structure factor. And this one is the normal scale of the structure factor. 
and both plots are there because in the first one we saw that the in a low case the structure factor is very similar to the structure factor of a sphere. It makes sense because the system is quite finite. But we have um, but we can see that the structure factor goes very small and anti one for kitchen like does go up. So uh, it's not stealthy uniform, but we are going the way. The problem that we have is that it's not, it's not possible to see in the picture, but I can tell you that there is a lagging effect. And there is a problem. Uh, the thing is that the system should be bigger to try to, to generate this, this system. So before to try to use your feet, we need to try to uh, get the structure using this, this potential. And then we are right now we are developing an uh, implementation using periodic boundary condition to try to generate the system. A very interesting because uh, you need a, a big system. You need the pressure of all the particles that are, are outside in order to get uh, the good properties. The important thing, well, the important thing is that we are able to fit to this potential. We need to do a further work in order to be able to really generate this, this potential using the real space uh, potential. Um, well, I would like to finish only with another uh, example. In the case that imagine that now we have our particles uh, and we have a given potential, the, the, a given per interaction potential. It's called like a U plus, depending on the distance, and it's associated to energy density distribution. And we have another energy potential with another energy uh, density distribution. So if we add up, um, both of them, we have another energy, an, uh, another energy, another uh, potential. But the energy potential, the interesting thing, the energy potential should be always positive, it's always active. So the question is, if it's possible to generate two different potentials in such a way that the sun, the total sun is equal to zero in a given range of distance. So this means that the per interest potential is equal to zero, and uh, we can go further in order to study the many body interaction, what is the effect of, what is the, for example, the equilibrium condition if the three body potential are the dominant in your, in, in your dynamics. And this is the idea. You have a, a two potential that are totally the opposite, and then try to get a, a zero of the potential. Uh, we try to do that. This is the, the target, the objective, the aim, uh, and this is the feed that we, we did. In the we can see that the difference, the sum of no, the difference of the sum is, is, is no zero, but it's relatively small. But the important thing that is smaller than KVT. And this maybe is, in, is, is enough to do a, a molecular dynamics and get a, a new distribution of a new equilibrium configuration. And then this is the this is the idea we are looking for in order to to study what is the the, the effect of high order uh, domination, no, high order uh, uh, high order interaction between your particles, no. In order to, for example, uh, this is very pragmatic, it's possible to find new equilibrium configuration. For example, uh, if the correlation function is different when the particle interaction potential is equal to zero, or if, there's, if many, if other, if the many body forces are the dominant one. And um, this working process. And um, with this example of trying to get a zero potential, but with energy intensity that is positive. Uh, I, and I, uh, I am in the end of the talk. Uh, well, for take home, take home messages, it's true. Uh, uh, I can say the random field is important. The random field induce optical forces that are conservative. I show you this expression that the, and the random field, uh, the, the potential is proportional to the energy density distribution and the property of your particle. And then we can try to place around what is the energy distribution in order to if any specific per interaction potential or in general many body uh, interaction potential uh, can be engineering uh, by modifying what is the spectral density that we are using. Uh, and then the idea to, to engineering this, uh, the potential is to use potential that are interesting in physical, uh, in physical domain. For example, if we can get a potential that generates a tethy uniform pattern, in principle, we can do it. We need to be able to solve all the problems in order to get a, a good uh, system. And also, this could be a very good way to try to study the dynamic when the pre-interaction potential is equal to C. Um, that's all. So to say thank you so much for listening. Okay, thank you so much, Theo. Uh, is there any question in the audience? You've been asking questions in the meantime, but 
If not, a very good, quick question. So if I understood things correctly, you're using a scalar for disability in your uh, description. In principle, your is, uh, I use a scalar, but it can be any kind of disability. And could you get any interesting effects, like simulating the effects of magnetic fields or magnetic dipoles or something more exotic that... Well, it's possible because the, in the end, the, the DDMA is written here, the DMAT. Yeah, in the end, so this portability can be any portability. This can be a, a tensor. And then you can play with uh, chirality, you can play with uh, uh, magnetic optics. The thing is to. But you haven't we didn't tested do, anything. We didn't test it. Okay. And the thing is to know what, is the, what can be interesting. Yeah, say, ah, that's yeah. what I was asking, basically. No, <laughs> we didn't explore the direction where it's interesting. But of course, there is something very interesting. Excellent. And so why do you have to go to a zero potential through the sum and subtraction of two potentials? Uh, why I want I want to do that? Or oh. why so can, can you just use a zero potential? Ah, the, the thing we, we need to get a, a we want to get zero potential, but with energy in the system. Of course, if you don't have any field, the potential is zero, and then you don't have and you have energy. to do it through that kind. So but you could use any other potential that you look like. Yeah, but the idea is if you give energy to the system, you have a, as a, you have something that the per, that this is the per interest potential. It's true that maybe there is no well explained. But uh, the, if the idea is to get the, the true body, so the per interest potential equal to zero, but with field, with uh, giving energy to the system. Mm -hmm. So this means that we will we'll have another intervention or some many body particle intervention. And this is the idea to study this. This intervention, uh, because how do you think that you, how you can place a zero potential? Uh, the only thing I have in my mind is to have nothing on trying to. But you, you could, I mean, so if you're you're fitting that, maybe you could use a like a a bound. Say okay, so this has, the potential has to be zero, but the energy between the particles. Okay. No, I, I I simply don't know. So I, so it seems. It like, seems like a one odd possibility, no? Because you are taking those. Ah, yeah, of course, of course. No, it's true that in this case we use the. Ah, okay. Maybe you say this. Why do you use this shape? Well, the two things. I mean, so in the end, what you want is a zero potential. Yeah, it's true. This is arbitrary. They we started with our potential. Potential. I don't know why they say that this is okay, and then we we take the sample. But probably it's true. No, we can use any different potential. The idea is no. If you are able to do a positive potential, it's difficult to do the negative to get the, to get to the constraint of the energy positive. And one of the questions that that Javi and I were discussing before. But so you have an homogeneous. So so the the random field is homogeneous. So this is yes. So it doesn't depend on any and in the position of the one of the particles. That's why the potential just depends on the difference of the uh, so the idea to use random field because they are homogeneous is true that it is not easy to get a real homogeneous field in a broad area. But uh, yeah, the idea to use random field for that. Um, so the potentials only depend on the distance of the particles, but not on the position of the particles. Yes, the, the thing when you have only, this is the, it's true that maybe it's not well explained that uh, <coughs> all of the sample or the vast, the majority part of the sample, I focus in the case will have only two particles. And then the force, since there is no any chirality, there is, on, there is a scalar probability, the force only depends, or the potential only depends on the distance. Mm -hmm. And when you have more particles, it's true that it depends on the distance of all particles. And in this case, we are cancel the per interaction potential. So if you have only two particles, the potential is zero. But you have three particles, the two particle potential is zero, but uh, you have another contribution given by the um, crosstalk between mm -hmm. different. But you, you cannot ensure that, no? Because you, so you're just calculating that for two particles. Yeah. So if you use a third one, you don't know how. No, to... yeah, because you can demonstrate that we have three particles, the three part, the total three particle potential can be is equal to the two particle potential by a three particle potential. It's a generic, uh, for this kind of field, uh, you can do this, you can do this. It's, uh, indeed, we, we do something because we, for doing that, we take, the, for example, we take the, the Taylor series for the log, and then we can a grouping, grouping the 10, that only you have only, uh, there is only two particles, or the 10 that have three particles, the 10 have four particles, and doing that, 
you see that the total potential can be seen like at the sum of the two particles. The sum of a tenda only has three particles. And then if you are able to cancel two particles, you, you know that it doesn't matter how many particles you play, that the two particles is equal to C. And how can you ensure that the solution is unique? It's univoca. Uh, in regarding the, uh, the fit? Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, obtaining the backward potential. That there can be other combinations of randomness. Well, no, because it's homogeneous, right? Of a spectral density and... Yeah, no, it's a good question. Uh, this unique, uh, I have no idea. Uh, there is works. Uh, there is people, uh, there is like a unique relationship between any body potential with a two body potential, but I don't know if those things in the ratio. There must be well, some theorem because otherwise I wouldn't dare to say it's univocal. Yeah. No, it's a really good question. Okay. All right. Well, if there are no more questions, it's almost one. So thank you so much, Theo. Thank you. And uh, thank you all for your. Uh,